Section 1 of Wheels, the Sixth Cycle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo, Eva Davis, Newgate Novelist, and Algy Pug. Two Mexican Pieces by Osbert Sitwell ah que bonitos son los sananas los chiquititos y mexicanos old mexican song one song how jolly are the dwarves the little ones the mexicans hidden by the singing of wind through sugar-cane out comes the pretty one out comes the ugly one out comes the dwarf with a wicked smile and thin the little women caper and simper and flutter fans the little men laugh stamp strut and stamp again dance to the bagpipe drone of insect semitone swelling from ground slashed with light like zebra skin the little cardinal the hummingbird whose feathers flare like flame across the valley of volcanic stone like an arrow from a rainbow that the armored plants have lain low stops to watch the dwarves as they dance out of sight hair long and black as jet is floating yet on amber air honey shaded by the shadow of popocatapetl's cone their fluttering reboses like purple petaled roses fall through tropic din with a clatter of light the crooked dwarf now ripples the strings of a mandolin his floating voice has wings that brush us like a butterfly music fills the mountains with a riot of fountains that spray back on the hot plain like a waterfall smaller grow the dwarves singing i'll bring shoes of satin smaller they grow fade to golden motes then die where's the pretty one where's the ugly one where's that tongue of flame the little cardinal two machiche the mexican dwarfs can dance for miles stamping their feet and scattering smiles till the loud hills laugh and laugh again at the dancing dwarfs in the golden plain till the bamboos sing as the dwarfs dance by kicking their feet at the jagged sky that torn by leaves and gashed by hills rocks to the rhythm the hot sun shrills the bubble sun stretches shadows that pass to noiseless jumping jacks of glass so long so thin so silent and opaque that the lions shake their orange manes and quake in a shadow that leaps over popocatapetl terrifies the tigers as they settle cat-like limbs cut with golden bars under bowers of flowers that shimmer like stars buzzing of insects flutters above shaking the rich trees treasure trove till the fruit rushes down like a comet whose tail thrashes the night with its golden flail the fruit hisses down with a plump from its tree like the singing of a rainbow as it dips into the sea loud red trumpets of great blossoms blare triumphantly like heralds who blow a fanfare till the hummingbird bearing heaven on its wing flies from the terrible blossoming and the humble honey-bee is frightened by the fine honey that is heavy like money and purple like wine while birds that flaunt their pinions like pennons shriek from their trees of oranges and lemons and the scent rises up in a cloud to make the hairy swinging monkeys feel so weak that they each throw down a bitter cocoa nut or mango up flames a flamingo over the fandango glowing like a fire and gleaming like a ruby from guadalajara to guadalupe 
it flies in flying drops of feather and the snatching dwarves stop dancing and fight together end of section section two of wheels the sixth cycle this librivox recording is in the public domain nero in the circus by aldous huxley down the steep cable thick as a man's thigh foot after monstrous foot delicately placing walks the huge elephant a dancer treads his broad grey back blows a kiss strikes a pose across the gulfs of tinted sunlight float his thin evaporated snatches of song and round the circus fifty thousand faces silently drink the sight and sound oh what an artist he is what an artist oh what temperament what execution what white arms what a soul what beautiful beautiful air i too have heard in the hanging beer gardens i too in the violet nights of june have heard minna von barnhelm weltberühmte cornette piston virtuosen play pupchen and the blue danube what a soul he strikes his lyre and the arpeggios rise bubblingly like the last breathed cry of a woman drowning at night in a calm sea he sings orestes and troy burning troy rosy and gold and beautiful he sings jove in the form of beasts making strange love and in the form of a beast actaeon slain fur for the dogs and in the fur a man and there was minna too minna von barnhelm through the cornet piston moistly blew a temperament oh the artistic one the handsome schoolboys she seduced the bills she left unpaid the wine the tempers the number of times she married and was divorced she had a soul you know what artists are the paid applause breaks out five thousand strong the young men rattle and buzz and stamp their feet and the grave elephant patiently waits while nero tunes his harp for a third encore end of section Section three of Wheels The Sixth Cycle This Librivox recording is in the public domain Picture by Goya by Aldous Huxley It is a scene of murder elegant as some dejeuner sur l'herbe O oh, pied musicians playing to silken queens and cavaliers and O oh, the tall tubed hats and the black coats and rosy rosy amongst them bright living body at the funeral feast memento vivere a naked girl with sun-drowsed revellers and in the grass the country copulatives tumbling together but here the sleepers bleed the tumbling couples struggle but not in love the naked girl kneels at the feet of one who hesitates voluptuously between a rape and a murder bandits angelical and you rich corpses truth is your sister goodness your spouse towering skies lean down and tall tall trees impose their pale arsenical benediction making all seem exquisitely remote and small and silent like a village fair seen from the hilltop far far below and yet they walk on the village green to whom the fair is huge tumultuous formidable earth lies unremembered beneath the feet of dancers who looking up see not the sky but towers and bright invading domes and the fierce swings scythe-like reaping and ravaging the quiet and when night falls the shuddering gas flares scoop out of the topless dark a little vault of smoky gold wherein the dancers still jig away gods of a home-made universe end of section
Section four of Wheels The Sixth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sonnet by Alan Porter. I am numb through with the coldness of thwart men, not angry men, unconcerned or shy, scant of love, scared of loving, when most kind, most cabined, apart in marriage tie men are the white dissevered weary stars of stern stone martyrs round cathedral gates they are miners lamps captives cooped with bars of own fashioning foiled with mean hates yet love here and there can master and mock impediment flies free sings and wings wild and strong idly for others lock block still their lives and hindered heart rings love cries low by wilderness ways where is hearing harbouring love hospitable air end of section section five of wheels the sixth cycle this librivox recording is in the public domain design for a printed calico by sherard vines well caught don't pretend you're fluttering strips of paper fingers phosphorescent in the gape of the shrubbery didn't signal catch me across go and get sober your nostrils twitch old Egypan. across that green lacquer tea tray of a lawn these lanterns burning with straw flames that rustle are discreet for young lovers your neck and breast are as white as mordant as unslaked lime you hobbled as you ran podagra chalky white i'll stain them with my kisses into the violet dappled convex of a cypripedium now i feel your hair brush me a mere whisper of a thunderstorm hall down behind the moon you take your hands off you hurt with your black nails too late i've got you now the little fool is fainting why is she like that look it's all wires and wood and cardboard she twangs like a banjo look at the sawdust running out of what a trick to play an old man after supper pulling a marionette to pieces i'll have this piece as a souvenir pie de riz champagne colour this sawdust is worse than snuff the orchid in my buttonhole is as limp as a burst balloon i'm afraid of this cypress it's made of tin it might twang let's have some champagne and go and see the fireworks. End of section. Section six of Wheels, the Sixth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Quadrant by Sherard Vines. The police women stand under the Georgian arcade on the lookout for poor poles who stop to adjust a garter or have a joke spoiling our fun can't stand a girl of drink nowadays under the arches of soap-coloured plaster they huddle awkwardly like faded wax mannequins a foreshortened group in doleful indigo shrinking from the observant lamps white cherries floating in the vinous liquor of night in that sallow arcade staring with sunken jaws and eyes they recede on one another looking sternly at the poor poles end of section section seven of wheels the sixth cycle this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Subjective Odyssey by H. R. Barber 
In the cool of evening, I and myself go voyaging, seeking a ghoul grotesquerie, a sublimated, intensified, paradisal Piccadilly, circus with its half-past one a.m., denizens, doxies and drabs, and rubber-heeled custodians of the woe that worldwide mediocrity has made in its own blear image, and christened after Christ. You may think that silly, but you can't blame them. After all, Christ came to save the silly. At present, true, he has not quite succeeded. More time, of course, is needed. The soul goes voyaging, barbers off on a new spin-drifty tack. The damned chill spray can't wash high hopes away. Anon he's scouting for brazen butterflies, or moths of steel, flapping with his coat all the meads of self-esteem neath the blistering sun, the cynic son of a gun. See, he brings down one, a fluttering, frail trifle of steel and vigour. Dreams made them so, crystal hard, whereas hopes and abstractions puff up, bigger and bigger, till they rival footballs, mattresses, or the necks of German bankers. This captivating captive, trifle of steel and vigour, one can't be cruel or wise, and pinch her dead with a sharp, accurate surmise, so away she flies, and while she flirts in the luminous air, and flits in such wise that amazement on our cousin Barber sits, I tug his coat-tails, point him over the way where the light is gay on the tavern, and men make better company than these tenuous forms, fancy-born, that only fancy inhabits. Love's a good game for winter evenings, or spring or summer, but tame for ever and anon. The apogee stales, desire is up a tree, nought's left but to take a cab to infinity, but necessity warns you to put a luncheon basket under the seat, since bore and bored must eat. But hang infinity! I'll stay a while in the tavern here with me. My alter ego leans across the table, asking the inveterate question, What is yours? As if I'm able to state a case for casualty. The malign decrepit bartender who pours red wine or white, illusions bright or bitter tincture of dead and rotten hopes into my cup. While inclination gropes in the littered pigeonholes of memory, deciding how I'll sup, I lose the comfort of good comradrie, for Barber lounges intently over the way to a white-avised, stray, gay girl, and loneliness distills nostalgic chills about me as the mists close on the hills. Sight and sense barter disdain for folly's recompense. The old hunt begins again all over. The dog's eared pages are re-read from cover to cover. What then, crawl all your days along these dismal ways, this vicious circle, too small for vice to circle, this via media, this mean parade, contends myself, coming back from the girl with a gleam of contempt in my eye, and I am fain to reply, take up your trade. A bout of work will soon set things right. A hammer drowns women's chatter. They can't abide the clatter. Thus I, an alter ego, fall into step and walk through the night, and in the morning greet the new risen sun, the intemperate son of a gun, with a grin that mocks the affright of overnight. End of section Section 8 of Wheels, The Sixth Cycle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Baron Tree by H. R. Barber Go forth, my song's antithesis, make a loud claim, acclaim your claim beyond the word's periphrasis. Perchance unwisdom, sensing this, shall turn again, Whittington-wise, and with indefinite surmise, born of impertinence, find tame toys modelled of logic and of sense, mechanic toys that toy with sense, as with a painted coconut carved to the feature of its butt. Pay her no homage, 
She'd reject homage, since homage came of age, And struts and fawns and apes a rage That simian prototypes affect. Nor ask what you would have. She turns grief to a grin, and grins to growls, Twirling the whirligig bright prism, And while Sir Malkin throatily howls, Me aw, me aw, my own adored, Trolling his pussy catechism, He far outleaps the solecism Which solely reason can afford. She tweaks his love twixt thumb and finger, And lest the enamoured dolt should linger, Shouts, Candid appeal is like candied peel best served on trifles. If you feel barbs in the flesh, thorns in the quick, leave the jade, ply your zany stick on your own back. Time's tick tactic warns, down the ages all the sages have found no sauce to season geese. The season's salt is ennui's surcease, and holidays throughout the year fall only when the coast is clear. No sooner is the last guest gone than we skate over the Rubicon of frozen tea and well-iced cake, avoid the vastly void abyss, that after-tea-ish mood. We hiss high over depths or shoal. The lake grunts to our passing as if drunken. Dues of a mate are dues of death when proffered vainly. There's a sunken snag in her wit that wrecks your bark bark as you may for all your baying if she's your quarry you'll make no maying a saffron yellow soul is hers and yellow stands for buttercups butter melts in his mouth who sups runs sleekly too as run his words together when her image occurs in his imagining dead birds quotidian gifts of happy hue piled at her feet she deigns to view never. Jewels tossed in her lap vainly implore a kindlier hap. Content she laps the fool's abuse. A puss in comfortable red shoes. Red riding hoods are cosy wear on winter nights when knights of cheer go wandering on little steeds that clop a clop through fancy's meads. And only fancy, here's a knight on bended knee, devout, his plight is manifest, his needs shine bright. Some time, praise be, the times will change, fate will kindle her cooking range, and goose flesh will smell kind in the nose. The white avised moon will doze quiescent over the hills, or ply her traffic in the leaves. Adown the sky, the hot head, fat, precarious sun will take it in his head to run. Imagination, bolder grown, will reach through twilight's bars to catch the winsome wench, all goldy brown, and prison her in his booby hatch. End of section. Section nine of Wheels, the Sixth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Parade Virtues for a Dying Gladiator by Sir Cheverell Sitwell For safety, hear this, common mortals. March with the others, swing your arms. Don't step too fast, don't reach so far. Laggards are devoured by wolves. If you but reach the enemy first, an eagle from the iron air will soar steep down and peck your eyes. Be the first to steal down fire, and you shall lie on the aching rock a threatening wing your roof and shade the scaffold stands and totters in the wind a cage for the light a platform through the clouds remark a scaffold and a scaffolding a terrace for death and bars for young birds at the top he stoops to work the shadows give him longer limbs he strides on stilts to tie the ropes only string can hold the floors and keep the telescopic roofs apart. A little rubbing of dry hands, snatches of sawdust on the floor, then he nods for the fanfare, like a god. A screech of trumpets. Before we guess, before we know what he stands there for, the planks split up, they bend like rushes, 
the frightened birds fly off he tumbles falls through the brittle lights that snap and give like waves when a meteor falls they flood the arena cover the sands the beaked warboats raise their sails like birds they tack in the wind the second philosopher appeared proudly holding a ladder wait he was saying till we're near enough then watch me making for another world he did not climb he lined the deck the sailors helped him charged with their ram the other ship was staggered helpless they lay alongside near enough over with the ladder he climbed along his little weight decided things the two boats went apart the hooks the claws of his ladder were wrenched out he lay like a man between wild horses one arm came off and then a leg they picked him into a boat rowed off drained out the water and when the sand was dry there he lay close to the other the two philosophers together again the third put up a horn to his mouth i deny he roared a better world but i hope a stranger not a nicer heaven also your fault and not my choice and then he disappointed the crowd fell like a log without one struggle killed by poison drunk in secret as my turn the fourth man shouted i'll walk on stilts through the drying water collect the bodies carry them out and give them to the crowd for burial then he began tremendous tests beat one stilt with an axe to break it looked through the eye holes of his visor bared an arm to feel his sword then on one leg his whole weight leaning he strapped his other leg to the stilt knocking it on to a wall to test it both legs finished he cannot stand he has to stamp and stagger around a tireless peripatetic they hand him helmet sword and trident and last of all the trumpet that he hollows down now he is ready to start steel clad and shod with hoofs of sounding wood he grips the trumpet with his teeth bears the trident holds the net the first he comes to still is breathing he lances him with a trident lifts him opens the net for the crumpled body the second man legless armless lies there helpless little is left for the wide-tongued trident the man who drank the poison died but still the venom lives within him he is spiked with the same three lances and the same points transfixing both killed the other who was breathing but being limbless could not move the weight of the two together stifled strained and made this gladiator gasp to right himself he must stand still he stumbled drew to his height and fell next we saw one stilt come out and wave above the shallow water he disengaged it dropped it off the other leg was doubled up but he could sit knee-deep in water and use the floating stilt as a crutch his trident stuck up out of the sand the visor and the trumpet still were his helmet for head and tube for voice enough material for martial music the drums were rattling for his death but there he sat and did not die he had the only pair of stilts and whilst the water ebbed from him leaving this monster on the sand he can string out platitudes and make a dying actor's speech how do we differ from dull soldiers these were the words he started with where is the gulf for us to jump where are the stairs for me to climb so that i ride a horse a cloud and rule the azure fields of air why do i want these is it vain to try and open gates of glass they are transparent is it vanity that i wish for men to see me ride beneath these gates and glitter shine the other side from them now they stand where then i stood they see me where i nothing saw but when i came up behind the glass the lights to show me dazzled me now i grope through a golden fog i stumble on the beams of stones 
I never see the road I walked. Lamps blind me, blatant shouting deafens me. The more I stumble, more they cheer. I suggest these virtues to all dying gladiators. Never bury your rivals' bodies. Let their corpses taint the air. Do not put them in caves for the relic hunters, but leave them to the vultures. They will quicken the decay. This virtue I learnt first today. Your enemies must feel both edges of the sword. They shall be laggards for all hungry wolves, and pray for the vultures if they die too soon. This is why I build my house using tombstones from damp fields. That is why I said today I'd gather the bodies and give them to you, letting you dig and hide them yourselves, and keep you busy, fill your minds, so that while I stand in the glare you watch me not, but grope with your hands, running the sand through greedy fingers. Now I have light more prying than the sun, no audience so nervous as the fainting stars who gently withdraw but watch behind the dark. None are there spying. So you see, I have gathered my rivals, given them over to you, occupied your attention. Now there is full light for me, and no rivalry. Alone I can work my wonders, alone in my own hours of day. But then he worked his own greatest wonder. His head dropped, knees sank, and he rolled into the water. That is a virtue, but not a parade one. Soldiers should run away to live another day. Good as far as he went. Good to gather and expose the corpses, but weak of him to die, knee-deep in water. I should admire him more sitting on his box, or washed ashore on a querulous hen-coop. This much I like, that he walked on stilts, that the role he chose never let him stop, that he could not stand but must stamp ahead. It seemed to me, if my turn should come, that I would not rake the sand, scour out, and clear the threshold of the statue dust, any more than build with the dead, mute stone, that I would not snap the fallen swords, or sharpen their points to help me, neither slay the old, or build the new religion, neither beg the streets, or live on an altar. Parade these virtues, dying gladiators. Beware of the final, finishing copestone. Hang many masks from your belt, but the last one awkwardly stops your disguise, until you break the string, to take the bead, and tumble the walls of your paradise. If you cage your growing trees, no birds will float through them and sing. If there are walls, you cannot watch the fields that slope down till they hold the deep sea. Between yourself and the waves, there lie all that divides and walls you in. A paradise is dangerous to hunt through for the rare tigers among the tropical trees. If you had never attempted this, you had never been lying wounded now. An icy wind interrupted this flow. A fall of stage snow fluttered from the roof. We were aghast to see the gladiator rolling the snow in his trembling hands, not to soothe him, for the next scene was a fight on sledges. But the gladiator finished several handfuls, and then he threw them into the audience. It was a very irritating dust. It broke into clouds till everybody sneezed. So I took my hat and coat and went, letting them sneeze and seeing them weep. And I turned this thought in my mind. Surely the gladiator threw this snow, wanting their tears, for two good reasons. First, said he, I'll have them cry, their tears shall flow for my timely death. Secondly, their tears shall hide and veil, until with smarting they cannot see, and then they'll miss my proud successor. Naples, 17th of the 11th, 1920 End of section Section 10 of Wheels, The Sixth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. An Imitation 
by Sir Cheverell Sitwell. God, in the whizzing of a pleasant wind, shall march upon the tops of mulberry trees. George Peel I was lying in the dappled shade, the loot hung lifeless in my lap, when God stepped out of a moving cloud to tread the tops of mulberry trees. He hushed the trumpets, furled his flags, and made his angels wave their wings. Thus was blown the pleasant wind that wafted him within my sight. And when I saw him through the leaves, I knew he trod his winepress there. The nectar sliding from the mountains did not please him like those berries. I touched my strings, and God looked down. He smiled on me, and gave me wings. But e'en his plumes had not the glow the fire of fruit lit in the air. And all the while he kept his pace, and marched on in the whizzing wind. I ran behind with feathered feet, and followed him as best I could. Had I gone quite far enough, we should have reached a black man's land, where ebon faces show out clear against the brooks and crystal waves. But dying daylight told the hour, and warned me I had best turn back. I wept at parting, then I smiled, and knew the purpose of these plumes. For with their help I bridged the air, I perched upon the silent sill, and from this height my lute will sound, and I shall catch the whispered call. Renishaw, 7th of the 9th, 1920 End of section Section 11 of Wheels, the Sixth Cycle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Another Imitation by Sir Cheverell Sitwell God, in the whizzing of a pleasant wind, shall march upon the tops of mulberry trees. George Peel Can a white wave its coolness keep and break beneath the hot sun's stare? Will incense trees for ever weep or do they too our changes share? Flowers climb on the trees but once To cloud those heavens with their stars. The fountains need a melting ounce, A load of snow, to start their wars. The blossoms and the leaping springs Ask for kindness ere they start. An eagle grows strong with its wings And cannot pray without this part. The wine lies in the grape until a plucking hand can take its might. Barred is the window, mute the sill, unless you climb to grasp the sight. So, as I played my lute and sang, I saw God in the mulberry trees. His angels clapped their wings, there rang a pleasant wind that bore the bees. Still swifter to the flowers that flamed and shone like lamps in deepest dark, and all the unicorns we tamed ran to cool themselves and hark. For God was singing as he went, pressing nectar for his drink, and for the coolness that this lent, the beasts came thirsting to the brink. But I ran up the ladder fast, rattling the windows with my notes, and as I played, a splendour passed, and laughter on the wind still floats. Renishaw 7th of the 9th, 1920 End of section Section 12 of Wheels, The Sixth Cycle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Baruch Noir by Charles Orange It was when I was sitting by the side of the lake, by the side of a lake, where the great trees come to the water's edge, and when, beneath the glittering leaves, I was watching the gleaming, mobile water, the water that was like a thousand living mirrors in the sunlight, that I turned my head. I turned my head amidst the green warmth to the road, and I saw a procession of old, frayed barouches filing by, old, broken down barouches that followed their soundless horses soundlessly and contained loads of young dead people 
propped up in outrageous positions dressed in the clothes of many periods i saw four couples sitting in a row embracing one another one couple had exchanged hats the last barouche that passed had a placard tied on with string we are the lovers that drowned themselves in this lake end of section section thirteen of wheels the sixth cycle this librivox recording is in the public domain two bucolic poems by edith sitwell one on the vanity of human aspirations in the time of king james the first the aged countess of desmond met her death at the age of a hundred and forty years through falling from an apple tree chronicles of the times in the cold wind towers grind round turning turning on the ground in among the plains of corn each tower seems a unicorn beneath the sad umbrageous tree and the goose girl could i see but the umbrageous tree behind ne'er cast a shadow on her mind a goose round breast she had goose brains and a nose longer than a crane's a clarinet sound cold forlorn her harsh hair straight as yellow corn and her eyes were round inane as the blue pebbles of the rain young anne the goose girl said to me there's been a sad catastrophe the aged countess still could walk at a hundred and forty years could talk and every eve in the crystal cool would walk by the side of the clear fish pool but to-day when the countess took her walk beneath the apple trees from their stalk the apples fell like the red gold crown of those kings that the countess had lived down and they fell into the crystal pool the grandmother fish enjoying the cool like the bright queens died on a playing card they seemed as they fanned themselves flat and hard floated in long and checkered gowns and darting searched for the red gold crowns in the castles drowned long ago where the empty years pass weedy slow and the water is flat as equality that reigns over all in the heavenly state we aspire to where none can choose which is the goose girl which is the goose but the countess climbed up the apple tree only to see what she could see because to persons of her rank the usual standpoint is that of the bank the goose girl smoothed down her feather soft breast when the countess came aloft king james and his courtiers dressed in smocks rode by a hunting the red gold fox and king james who was giving the view halloo across the corn too loudly blew and the next that happened was what did i see but the countess fallen from the family tree yet king james could only see it was naughty to aspire to the high at a hundred and forty though if as he said she aspired to climb to heaven she certainly has this time and anne the goose girl laughed to he it was a sad catastrophe two green geese to richard jennings the trees were hissing like green geese the words they tried to say were these when the great queen claude was dead they buried her deep in the potting shed the moon smelt sweet as nutmeg root on the ripe peach tree's leaves and fruit and her sandalwood body leans upright to the gardener's fright through the summer night the bee-winged warm afternoon light roves gilding her hair wooden nutmegs and cloves and the gardener plants his seedsman's samples where no unicorn herd tramples in the clouds potting sheds he pots the budding planets in leaves cool as grots 
for the great queen claude when the light's gilded god sings miserere gloria laud but when he passes the potting shed fawning upon him comes the dead each cupboard's wooden skeleton is a towel horse when the clock strikes one and light is high yet with ghosts it winces all night mid wrinkled tarnished quinces when the dark air seems soft down of the wandering owl brown they know the clock-faced sun and moon must wrinkle like the quinces soon that once in dark blue grass do dabbled lay those ghosts like turkeys gabbled to the scullion baking the castle bread the spirit too must be fed be fed without our flesh we cannot see oh give us back stupidity but death had twisted their thin speech it could not fit the mind's small niche upon the warm blue grass outside they realized that they had died only the light from their wooden curls roves like the sweet smell of nutmegs and cloves buried deep in the potting shed sighed those green geese now the queen is dead end of section section fourteen of wheels the sixth cycle this librivox recording is in the public domain fantasia for mouth organ by edith sitwell i had a mother-in-law no other kin could be so kind said he she worried till the bladder of my figure seemed a ladder and would try to cancel it she would ring me on the mangle when the hot suns jangle bent the north pole to south and the wind hyperborean dried the marmorian wash for a nominal fee but the wheezing wind's harmonium seemed an encomium of life when one is free and as life was getting barrener i set out as a mariner the hero of this epopee i sailed on botanic gardens oceanic where siren birds sip their tea past the lodging-houses lean where ozone like glycerine oozes loosely we horses age had tattered flap along the battered platform grasses green bohe but the ship and the narrator had traversed the equator before i knew that fate's decree had seen fit to inflate the mother of my mate with the same wish as the refugee the south pole floating past was taller than a mast the north pole and the south congree or the ocean of red horsehair unknown of any corsair in the snow's cold ivory all smooth as a japonica in sound like an harmonica where the humming-bird quick lights flee to the polar sea's pavilion we paid for twenty million red velvet drinks with only one rupee and in the central hulk my mother-in-law's bulk sat reared upon the snow's settee her jangling jet bonnet with the polar lights upon it a cathedral seemed whose key was her nose a horny cockatrice goggling out to mock at these sights for each degree of the north pole and the south had for bonnets seas uncouth electric fish that curl like a trochee are there lithe and writhing locks the redskins came in flocks and pelted hairy fruitage from the tree then we floated back toward the equator flat as sword and green as grass the water seemed to be like a dulcimer or zither was the tinkling and the glitter of the icebergs as they floated airily for on water soft as calluses that open crystal palaces were those bergs of ice within news apogee were the queerest brightest pictures exhibitions with the strictures vanished from infinity then we traversed the equator and it was either fate or whatever other power is our pawnee but when natives with smooth joints and features like gilt points of the starfish moon came we saw their eyes like wrinkled tortoises and their hairs black vortices whirl 
as they sank upon one knee for when they saw my mother-in-law they decided not to tackle me she is tough as the armorian the leather that the saurian sun spreads on the sea so she saved my life did the mother of my wife who is more than a mother to me end of section section fifteen of wheels the sixth cycle this librivox recording is in the public domain early spring by edith sitwell the wooden chalets of the cloud hang down their dull blunt ropes to shroud red crystal bells upon each bough fruit buds that whimper no wind slough our faces furred with cold like red furred buds of sadder springs long dead the cold wind creaking in my blood seems part of it as grain of wood among the coarse goat locks of snow mamselle still drags me to and fro her feet make marks like centaur hoofs in hairy snow her cold reproofs die and her strange eyes look oblique as the slant crystal buds that creak if she could think me distant she in the snow's goat locks certainly would try to milk those teats the buds of their warm sticky milk the cuds of strange long past fruit hairy springs beginnings of first earthy things end of section section sixteen of wheels the sixth cycle this librivox recording is in the public domain perpetua mobile by paul selver a pantoum more or less pilk lauds the verse of jobble to the skies and jobble says that bibson's dante's peer bibson is great on pag what art he cries while pag is sure that dubkin is a seer while pag is sure that dubkin is a seer dubkin swears botchel's odes will never wane botchel commands watch pimpington's career pimpington writes a book on troger's brain pimpington writes a book on troger's brain and troger shrieks glab's genius stirs my soul glab raves of cringely's rhymes with might and main cringely pens gummit's name on glory's scroll cringely pens gummit's name on glory's scroll and gummit sees in slud new worlds arise slud bids us hear pilk's mighty rhythms roll pilk lauds the verse of jobble to the skies end of section section seventeen of wheels the sixth cycle this librivox recording is in the public domain the death of mercury by augustine rivers to h r barber dullness the deity in conclave sat with mediocrity whose pork pie hat now flaunts with intermingled asphodel the homelier herbs that georgians love so well no baudelaire flowers now shed exotic scent but parsley garlic sweet and peppermint these goddesses love england where alone is dull praise given to their duller throne and as in state they to their temple go they hymn praise squire from whom all blessings flow oh may he prosper may his brood increase and death to all who are not dull as he is up from glad earth the chorus swells again praise squire praise squire we hear the swift refrain that leaps like fire from every school and college from stately london home or cotswold cottage wherever poet meets a poet brother 
or makes an income by reviewing each other the echo alters too we never tire of hearing squire on shanks and shanks on squire oh but these goddesses are in the right in praising squire for they are his delight a demigod himself he placed above for public worship and for private love and for the press to praise this radiant pair for them he fashioned in his secret lair though they inspired the precious small first bud that gummy muddy lily of my lud and for the sake of dullness placed apart the gift of parody his only art instead for them he makes the georgian book observer land and water and outlook for love of dullness have his loud bells pealed from gentlewoman and the ladies field as tribute to her he now apes for us squire the sublime eagle ridiculous the goddesses appreciate his gifts but so that in his ranks there will be no rifts send mercury their messenger with thanks to freeman turner and their prize-boy shanks for mercury the messenger is old fat and obedient does what he is told together with a letter for their lord that dullness hoped would strike a tender chord within his heart and make him plight his troth and demigod already how dull both and in this message lurked the latent germ of many a poem for the coming term a poem squire could write and then his school should echo dunce to dunce and fool to fool mercury spread his wings his outline swelled bellied balloon-like on the wind he held the precious missives till he caught the glint of all but gold of stucco brass and flint and flying down delivered one epistle where amid waving asphodel and thistle brows foursquare steadfast in their serried ranks the forms of freeman turner graves and shanks while reckless rickward and a thousand more rally and pass the word from bore to bore behind these showed the forms of many a villain two louis were there one was our mcquillan who writes for scottish journals passing show and many a paper that we do not know the other proving by his name when told that all that does not glitter is not gold skulking behind that black enormous building is louis golding better louis gilding near by another surly scot moncrief who brings the early saxon songs to grief who translates beowulf and then oh epitaph has on the cover his own photograph and dear this is to dullness in her dotage for she created moncrief in her image these warrior writers now unite to sink their petty quarrelling in slinging ink but squire who usually gives out each ticket has been away to-day playing cricket to aid church funds so in his room unseen rests mercury and reads a magazine in which much praise of dullness now appears he looks to see the name alas there leers his face his own that once spelt speed and joy drawn on the cover by the office boy the messenger of gods rests where he read in awful peace for mercury is dead as dead can be as dead as anne the queen or as that dullest deadest magazine note owing to the infectious prevalence of writing poems on classic themes mr augustine rivers has chosen the above title and has much pleasure in announcing the following classic poems in preparation paris and helen daphnis and chloe hero and blunder pyramus and thisbe bottom and mare's nest jolly old squire and shank's mare and six in a four-wheeler End of note. End of section. And end of wheels 
the sixth cycle recording by nemo eva davis newgate novelist and algy pug thank you for listening